Buenas tardes. Gracias por estar aquí otra vez con nosotros en nuestra siguiente sesión. Tenemos aquí a Kirk Johnson, él es presidente y director de operaciones de la empresa Evans and Sutherland. Kirk tiene una licenciatura en ingeniería eléctrica y un posgrado por la Universidad de Utah. Empezó su labor en Evans hace más de 25 años, donde era parte de la división de teatro digital, cuando fue formalmente organizada en 1995. Anteriormente dirigió programas en los grupos de soporte de producto y Civil Airlines de la compañía y se desempeñó como vicepresidente y gerente general de Evans y ha supervisado el desarrollo de las herramientas que ya todos conocemos, por lo menos nuestro vocabulario ya es común, el Digistar 3 y el Digistar 6. En su actual cargo como presidente y director de operaciones, es responsable de esta compañía en Salt Lake City y forma parte del equipo de la dirección ejecutiva de Evans Sutherland. Le damos la bienvenida a Kirk. Bueno, muchas gracias. Uh, bueno, está tiempo para su siesta, ¿ok? <risa> Realmente es un uh, buenos días, es un placer para mí estar aquí con ustedes. Uh, siempre me gusta venir aquí a México. Uh, le gust me gusta venir porque uh, me gusta la gente mucho. Son muy, son muy amables, me gusta conocerles mejor y pasear tiempo con ustedes. También me gusta venir porque las conferencias son muy muy buen organizados. Uh, le, me gustaría agradecer a Jesús Mendoza y Sandra, su equipo y Conocet para su apoyo por esta conferencia y el trabajo que hagan. También uh, 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 quiero decirles agradec agradecerlos el uh, planetario Enrique Erro y IPN por uh, su trabajo con esta conferencia. Uh, y finalmente, finalmente la razón que me gusta venir a México es me gusta la comida, ¿no? Es muy rica, parece, ¿no? Bueno, uh, pregunté a Enrique Fonte si debería hacer mi presentación en español o en inglés. Y él me dijo inglés. Pienso que no quiere escuchar mi Spanglés. Pero realmente no es Spanglés porque... Uh, aprendí mi español en la Argentina, entonces hablo castellano. Bueno, con su permiso um, voy a hacer mi presentación en inglés. Good morning. Um, uh, thank you for the opportunity to be here. Before I start my presentation, I would uh, like to just congratulate Malagros y, y Javier and their teams for the productions that we saw last night in the Dome. Uh, they were fantastic, and I was really excited to see the progress that has been made over the past four or five years in show production for planetariums and domes here in Mexico. I think we need to recognize not only, not only the, the teams that have done the work, but also Conacyt uh, for their support of uh, the productions and, and the funding of the productions in order to get uh, show production and content production in Mexico started off well. And I can see uh, that it's gone very well. I'm also excited to see the, the Los Jovenes, the youth that are involved in the productions. I think uh, getting the youth involved in, in the planetariums and dome theaters, getting them to use their skills and their creativity uh, bodes very well for the future of planetariums and, uh, and domes here in Mexico and throughout the world. So today I thought we would just spend a few minutes with you to talk about current and future technologies in dome theaters and planetariums. But the first thing I want to tell you is the most important thing is what you people do. It's the, the content and what you're able to put up on the dome. The system is really just a tool to help you uh, get what you want up on the dome quickly and easily. And so we as planetary manufacturers have that responsibility, I think, to make that as easy and, and as, 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 as possible. Uh, next slide, please. So I put up here that the goal is immersive reality. And what I mean by that is our goal is to enable you to get what you want up on the dome and have it be much more immersive, have it look like what you expect it to look like, and make it look real 
for your audiences so they can appreciate what it is that you're trying to teach them and accomplish or entertain, or, or entertain them with. Uh, next slide, please. So yesterday, um, Sean talked about in his opening speech a little, bit, a little bit about the history of planetariums. And I thought I'd start today with a little bit of history and the origin of digital planetariums. And Sean touched, touched a little bit on this, but I have a little bit different uh, origin. Uh, next slide, please. In the 1960s, there were two uh, professors at the University of Utah, uh, Dr. David Evans and Dr. Ivan Sutherland. They were professors of computer science. And they are known throughout the world as the pioneers and the inventors of computer graphics. And they started Evans and Sutherland in 1968. And so without their invention of computer graphics, we wouldn't be here today talking about what the future of digital systems is. So I, I think that's really the origin of digital planetarium systems. Next slide, please. Sean touched on this yesterday, but uh, the first digital planetarium system was introduced to the planetarium market in the early 1980s. There were two uh, technicians and engineers at Evans and Sutherland that were amateur astronomers, and they were working on what was called a calligraphic projector that was used in our commercial airline division. And it, would, it was a black and white projector, and it would, it would draw lines and dots. And they thought, if we turned this projector over and pointed it up, up at the ceiling, it would make an amazing three-dimensional digital star projector. And so that's when the digital planetarium was born. Now, instead of using optical projectors to just view the stars from Earth in two dimensions, we can now visualize the stars and the solar system and the universe and fly through that in three dimensions. Next slide, please. In the late 1990s and early 2000s, uh, the full dome planetariums as we know them today were first introduced. Most of those full dome planetariums used uh, CRT projectors. The CRT projectors were very, very, had very good contrast, which a lot of the planetariums liked because they had good dark skies, but they were limited in their resolution and in their contrast and in their uh, brightness, and they also became very expensive to maintain. Next slide, please. So in the early 2000s, uh, DLP and LCOS, liquid crystal on silicon projectors, began to be introduced into the full dome and planetarium industry. They were good because they were brighter, they were often smaller, and sometimes less expensive, less expensive to maintain and put lamps in, but planetariums didn't really like them as much because they had lower contrast, and so it, it kind of ruined their dark skies, and so it took some time before the, this new DLP technology took off in the planetary ministry, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later. Next slide, please. And next. Uh, I don't want to forget our optical friends. Um, there were some that, while they really liked the flexibility of digital planetariums, still clung to the star quality that optical projectors could provide. And so uh, there were those that could afford it and were wanting to deal with the complexity that, that used hybrid planetariums. Next slide, please. These hybrid planetariums typically use the optical star ball to view the stars, Earth-based stars viewing, and they use the digital system to overlay constellations and constellation outlines grids, etc. My experience is that most of these hybrid planetariums, after the first five or ten minutes, turn off the star projector and use the digital planetarium for the remainder of the presentation. Next slide, please. There's also uh, been a more uh, recent phenomenon, and that is the convergence of the full dome and planetarium industry with the large format, use of large format films in domes. Next slide, please. As I think most of you know, uh, IMAX installed their 1570 film systems that were made primarily for flat screen theaters in uh, many dome theaters around the world. For many years, they were kind of known as the gold standard for brightness and resolution in domes. Next slide, please. However, uh, if you're familiar with an IMAX dome, rather than having a complete 180-degree dome, they're typically 
165 degrees, and the image only covers about 75 to 80 percent of that 165 degree dome. So they're not really as immersive as a full dome system would be. Next slide. This shows a typical coverage of an IMAX film projector in a 165 degree dome. So you can see it, it only covers about 75 per, or 80 percent of that dome, and so it affects the immersiveness, immersiveness of the image. Next slide, please. So as these IMAX films got older and as capability of digital systems got more and more capable and projection systems got brighter and higher resolution, uh, we had customers asking us, can you help me replace my large format 1570 film system with a system that can not only do reproduce the quality of a 1570 film in a dome, but also has the flexibility and the capabilities of a digital planetarium system. So our, our engineering staff went to, get to, work, to work to put together a system that would meet these capabilities. Next slide, please. And so the first uh, IMAX 1570 film projector that was replaced by a digital system was the Me Science Museum of Virginia. And this happened about four years ago. Uh, shortly after the installation, we had a side-by-side -side comparison with the Giant Screen Cinema Association where we covered up half of the IMAX projector and half of the Digistar full dome digital projection system and had the two images frame sync together so you can compare them uh, directly side by side and most believed that this system was better quality than the IMAX 1570 film system. Next slide please. This system used uh, five 25,000 lumen DLP projectors blended together on a dome uh, to create a seamless image. So you need a lot of light if you want to reproduce what an IMAX film system can do. It was interesting because as we talked to the Science Center, uh, Science Museum of Virginia, they didn't really have an interest in doing planetarium shows. They were really interested in replacing their IMAX film system and planetarium was not really in their vocabulary. But after they received the system, found out what its capability was, it became a fundamental part of their show production. And so now, after every IMAX film system, they have a, a 10 or 20 minute presentation about the events in the sky tonight, and it's become a very popular and integral part of their, of their show programming at the Science Center. So we're very proud of that. Uh, next uh, slide, please. Uh, one of the challenges that we had is that some of these projectors don't like to be pitched and rolled in, uh, in, in dome theaters, and most IMAX theaters are tilted at 30 degrees. And so we had to be clever about where we could install those projectors, where they would not be at angles that they wouldn't operate properly. And with our alignment and blending systems, we were able to overcome some of those technical challenges so we can install uh, projectors in theaters and, and less than op optimal locations and still have the image look seamless and work well together on the dome. Next slide, please. And these are just some images from inside the Science Museum of Virginia. Uh, next. Next slide, please. Okay, so for a minute I'd like to talk about uh, resolution, uh, contrast, and brightness. As you are building a new uh, planetarium or dome theater or renovating an existing theater, it's important to understand the relationships between resolution, contrast, and brightness as you decide which projection system will best meet your needs. Next slide, please. Uh, this chart shows uh, relative resolutions. Uh, the first small green square represents VGA resolution. This is the resolution of uh, TV sets, original TV sets. I'm not sure that some of the younger people in the room know what a VGA or a, a 640 by 480 television set even looks like, but that's what it was. That's what, we, that's what us old guys had to put up with when we were kids. Uh, the next box shows what an HD TV would look like, and the third square is a 4K by 2K resolution projector or television set. 
this uh, smaller light blue circle represents a 4K uh, projection system in a dome. And the darker blue represents an 8K projection system in a dome. So you can see that an 8K projection system is about four times the resolution of a 4K system. Next slide, please. So I wanted to, to talk about and clarify some terms that are used uh, when planetariums start talking about uh, resolutions on their domes. Uh, we talk about 2K systems. What does that mean? A 2K system is a system that has about 2,000 pixels across the meridian, side to side, in a dome. These systems result in about 4 million unique pixels after the projectors are blended together on the dome. Uh, these systems are typically, 2K systems are typically made up of two 1920 by 1200 or 2560 by 1600 projectors blended together. Uh, we hear a lot about 4K. What a 4K system is, is that there are 4,000 pixels or 3600 to 4,000 pixels across the meridian on the dome. While you can use multiple 2K projectors, or lower resolution projectors to achieve this resolution, in today's theaters, it's most often done using two uh, 4K 4096 by 2160 video projectors. The next I'd like to talk about 8K. Uh, 8K is a term in, in the planetary industry that I think has been misused a little bit. And that's why I show it in, 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 in quotations. Uh, most of the 8K systems that are installed in theaters today are actually uh, 6K to 6.5K resolution systems. And that means there's about 6,000 to 6,500 pixels across the meridian of the dome. Most of these systems have about 28 to 30 million unique pixels on the dome after the projectors are blended together. And they're created using typically five or six 4K projectors blended together. Uh, because of the misunderstanding of the term 8K, uh, we at Evans and Southern termed a, fr a, a, a phrase called true 8K. And what a true 8K system is, is that you have a minimum of 8,000 pixels across each meridian on the dome. So everywhere you look, you have a minimum, and you're viewing a minimum of 8 thousand pixels. These systems are usually created using about 10 4K projectors and result in over 50 million unique pixels on the dome. Uh, the system that we're seeing here today at IPN and this week uh, uses uh, six uh, 4K projectors and it's an 8K system that has about 6,500 unique pixels across the dome at each meridian. Next slide please. This image just shows the difference in detail that you get when you zoom in to a 4K image versus an 8K image on a dome projection. Next. So the first true 8K system was the uh, system in Houston, Texas, the Houston Museum of Na Nature and Science. Now previous to this time, uh, this system installed about uh, February of last year, 2016. Previous to this time, there were a few theaters, such as Mark's Theater at the Adler Planetarium, that had 8,000 pixels across a few mer meridians on the dome, but not everywhere you looked was 8,000 pixels. So the Houston was the first one that actually had a true 8K system. Uh, it uses uh, 10 of the same projectors that uh, are being used here at IPN. Uh, these projectors are, are Sony projectors. They use a laser phosphor light source, and they're 4K projectors. Next slide, please. Again, just a few pictures inside the Houston Museum of Natural Science. Next. Okay, so as I mentioned, again, 10 Sony projectors like we're using here. Uh, has an auto alignment blending system that's important to keep the system looking good even after the installers have gone home. And again, we had to put the projectors in locations that were not ideal and because of some of the configurations and the doors and the, and the tightness and limited space that we had behind the dome. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, 
Okay, now I'd like to talk about uh, the trade-offs and the uh, compromises that sometimes you have to make between contrast and brightness. When you're building your new theater or renovating your theater, it's important to ask yourself some questions. What are my goals? Uh, what do I want my focus to be? Uh, is my focus primarily to do astronomy in my dome? And it are, is it important for me to have the darkest and the blackest skies for my star shows? Or do I want to focus on uh, large format films or giant screen films? Today, I think the answer to, to that question is, is generally both. I want to do both in my theater. Uh, sometimes that's not the case, but often it's both. But you have to have a focus. You have to know what it is that you want to focus on because ultimately, in today's world, there's still not a perfect projector that has the highest resolution, the highest brightness, and the highest contrast. And so you have to make some choices. And so you need to understand what those are as you start looking for what projection system you want to put in your theater. Next slide, please. So let's talk for a minute about contrast ratio. First, I'd like to talk about projector contrast ratio, and then we can talk about uh, system cost contrast ratio. Uh, projector contrast ratio is typically uh, defined as a sequential contrast ratio. What that means is a projector manufacturer turns the projector on at full white and takes a measurement of light output and then draws black and takes a measurement of light output. And the ratio between these two settings is the contrast ratio. It's called sequential contrast ratio. Okay, as I mentioned earlier, the CRT projectors that were used uh, 15 or 20 years ago in planetariums as kind of the standard planet projector had contrast ratios in approximately 100,000 to 1 race, uh, region. The DLP and L-cost projectors that are available today and used in mo most planetariums range from about 1,800 to 20,000 to 1 contrast ratio. And there are what are called high dynamic range or HDR projectors that have contra contrast ratios in excess of a million to one. Uh, one of the problems with these high dynamic range contrast projectors is right now they're often limited in brightness and in resolution. So one of, the, one of the things that I want to caution you at, of as you start looking at projectors and, and contrast ratios is be careful of terms like up to or variable. If they don't say sequential contrast, if they use up to or variable contrast, that means that projector manufacturers are trying to make their projectors look better than they really are. Okay, they're, they're using tricks and games. You usually have to turn down the brightness in order to, to achieve that contrast. And so you can't get the maximum contrast and the maximum brightness together at the same time. So that's projector contrast ratio. What, what do we mean when we talk about system contrast ratio? Well, the system contrast ratio is, is typically a, a measurement of what the contrast is once the system is installed and is projecting on the dome. And this takes into account the reflectivity of the dome it often is impacted by the materials that are used inside of the dome theater. That's why we typically uh, use dark materials inside dome theaters. And it also is impacted by e exit signs that are typically illuminated inside of a theater. And so you have to take close attention to these, op op to these items in order to optimize your system contrast ratio. A system contrast ratio is typically measured by putting up a black and white checker pa pattern from your projection system. And so you have 50% of the image that is white and 50% of the image that is black. And a typical system contrast ratio is only between 5 and 10 to 1. And that is irrelevant or irrespective of the contrast ratio of the projectors. The contrast ratio of the projectors in the end has very limited impact on the system contrast ratio. Interestingly enough, the biggest impact you get for a system contrast ratio is the reflectivity of the dome. So what that means is most of the domes that we install projection systems in have a reflectivity between 
30% and 55%. In the 55% reflective dome, you see in your eye about 55% of the light that reaches the dome is reflected back to your eye. So by changing and working with that reflectivity, we can increase the overall system reflectivity of your theaters. And so as you're looking at what projection system you want to buy, you need to consider how big is my dome, how bright are my projectors, and based on those criteria and also what you want your focus to be, whether it be planetarium and astronomy content or whether your focus is more towards giant screen films, you have to make some decisions about what it is you want to do and what reflectivity you want to paint your dome. Next slide, please. Okay, so we talked about contrast. Now let's talk a little bit about brightness. I put up here for reference uh, what the specification is for digital cinema. If you go to a Hollywood movie on a flat screen and see a movie, the specification for that theater is 14 foot Lamberts in 2D and four foot Lamberts in 3D. And the foot Lambert is the measure of how much light there is within a given area. In this case, a foot, there's a similar uh, measure of, of candles per, meters, per meter squared. Okay? In an IMAX 1570 dome projection system, the brightness varies depending on dome size, what kind of lamps the IMAX projector uses. But typically, the brightness of an IMAX film projector is between three and four foot Lamberts on a dome. And I put at, at the center because in an IMAX film projection system, the brightness drops off from the center of the image to the edge of the image by about 50%. Okay? This is an interesting, and this is, this is Kirk Johnson's estimate. It's not scientific. But I think I've been working in the planetary ministry now for nearly 25 years, seeing a lot of theaters. But I believe that 95% of the dome theaters and planetariums in the world have a brightness of less than a half of, of one foot Lambert on their domes. And I would say the majority of those are probably even less at about 0.3 foot Lamberts. And why is that important or why, why is that significant? Well, at these low resolutions, it's sometimes hard for us to get good color saturation and our eyes don't see color well. And it also impacts the clarity and what I call the effective resolution of what we're able to see. If the image is too dark, you can't see all of the resolution that might be on the dome. So why is that important to you? Well, it's important because as you create your content for the dome, it's important that it looks like what you want to see. And it's important for your audiences to see it how you want to see it and be able to portray it in a more realistic way. And so I think while contrast is very important and we focused on it in planetariums for a long time, I think we need to turn and give a little bit more attention to brightness as we move forward into the future with digital planetariums. So it's, it's my recommendation that w the goal should be to have a minimum of one, at least one foot Lambert in your dome. Uh, the projection system that we're looking at today here at IPN is a little bit more than one foot Lambert. So they have good color, the content looks great, uh, if, you're, if you're really focused on large format film, then you should strive to have two, three, and even four foot Lamberts of light on your dome. Uh, there's trade-offs and, and back and forth, and you have to manage that light, but it's important for you to understand, again, what do I want to accomplish in my dome, and based on that, which projection system, how do I paint my dome, what other decisions do I need to make? Finally, I'd like to, as we talk about brightness, I'd like to talk a little bit about 3D. Yesterday, the question about 3D in domes was brought up. Until about three or four years ago, frankly, projectors struggled to do 3D in domes well. So if you haven't seen 3D in a dome in the last two or three years, you should go to a, a new installation of a 3D system and see it in a dome. I think it can be very effective at teaching some of these uh, concepts and depth of, of the universe in domes. We've seen it in Cozumel and it, it has a great impact. But what's important to know is that anytime you put on 3D glasses, you lose automatically 70% of the light gets absorbed in those glasses. And so 
it's important that you start with a lot of light if you're wanting to do 3D because you lose so much in the efficiency of the glasses and the efficiency of the system. Next slide, please. As we're talking about brightness, uh, there's another uh, theater that we're working on currently that I'd like to just talk a little bit about. It's the Liberty Science Center in New Jersey. Uh, they have a 27-meter dome, which is the largest dome in the Western Hemisphere. Uh, they came to us and said they wanted to basically replace their IMAX theater, but they also wanted to maintain th the capability of a digital planetarium and, and share astronomy and sciences with their audiences. Because of the magnitude of a 27-meter dome, in order to duplicate and improve on the image quality of their 1570 film system, Next slide, please. We're having to use 10 30,000 lumen projectors. So that's 300,000 lumens of light that we're starting with before we blend and align those projectors in the dome. But after we're through, we'll have more than four foot lamberts of light on a 27 meter dome. And at the same time, they'll have a very nice high resolution star field that they'll be able to share with their audiences uh, astronomy and other scientific content, scientific visualization content, along with their IMAX film system. So in today's world, you can have both capabilities within the th coexist within in, in a single theater and be able to share those functionalities with your audiences. Next. And again, uh, because of the uniqueness of this theater, uh, we're not able to put projectors along the sides, and so the projectors are put primarily in the back and towards the front, but with the ability to project off axis and to be able to align those automatically and keep those aligned well, uh, we can work within the, the constraints of the theaters that you, that you are working with. Next slide, please. And next. So let's just talk for a few minutes about uh, current and future projection technologies. Uh, we talk, we hear a lot about lasers in today's market. I would say that 95%, maybe more, of the projection systems in the world today use a lamp-based projector. They use either UHP lamps or xenon lamps. But we're hearing more and more about lasers. And what we've heard most recently in the past year or two is about laser phosphor. So what is a laser phosphor projector? A laser phosphor projector uses an array of blue laser diodes to illuminate a phosphor color wheel. So they, there's a, a blue beam, uh, a, a, an array of blue, blue diodes that is used to, to, to illuminate this turning wheel of phosphor to, cre to create the colors for the projector. Uh, that is the technology that these projectors use is blue laser diodes as a light source. They're great. As you can see, these projectors are beautiful. They put out a nice laser light. They're lamp-free, which means they don't, you don't have to replace the lamps. And they're very quiet. One thing that you need to understand about laser phosphor is it's pretty common that over 20,000 hours, the brightness of these projectors is reduced by about 50%. So 20,000 hours is a long time. Um, you know, typ in a typical planetarium, that's seven, eight years, and so that's pretty good. And that, that degradation over time is about linear over that 20,000 hours. But in a lamp projector, every 1,000 or 2,000 hours, you can replace the lamps and get back to full brightness. But in a laser phosphor projector, that's more difficult and more expensive to do. We're hearing more and more about RGB lasers. RGB lasers are different from laser phosphor in that they have, instead of an array of blue laser diodes as a light source, they have a distinct red, green, and blue laser in most cases. And those lasers illuminate the, the uh, modulation device or the DLP chip or the LCOS chip directly. So the advantage of these projectors is you get very good color uh, the lifetime is typically more than that of a laser phosphor projector. But one disadvantage is that there are potential safety issues. 
These laser projectors are regulated in the United States by the Food and Drug Administration and in most countries by some organization and they're treated differently than a lamp based and often a laser phosphor based projector. So if you have projectors in your theater where an audience member can approach them, there are some things that have to be done in order to uh, prohibit that. Uh, Carter at the American Museum of Natural History has RGB lasers. They're able to do that in their theater because the spring line is quite a bit taller and it's difficult, if not impossible, for, a, for, a, for an audience member to get in up close to one of those projectors. So there's some safety concerns and safety issues if, if you decide you want to go with RGB laser projectors. Uh, we have to work with you to, to, to figure out where to install those and how we can put those in in a safe way. Also, it's my opinion that those projectors are new and they need a little bit more time and experience uh, before they're ready for prime time. So, Next, I put up on, on the dome uh, HDR lasers. Um, HDR, again, is a term that is sometimes misused, but in the context that I'm using, it's, it's a very high contrast projector in the million or million to one, million to one plus range. And so it's very high contrast, and with lasers you can also get very bright images. Uh, those projectors are being worked on by projector manufacturers. I still think they're a few years away before uh, they'll be available for use in most planetariums. Uh, they're currently very expensive, uh, they're very big, they're very noisy, um, and often they don't have a fast enough update rates. But I think in the future we'll see that projector in planetariums. And then I put up the last bullet, just for fun, uh, LED domes. There's been a lot of discussion and we've had customers ask us and, and frankly we've done some investigation about making the dome the projection system. And what about making a dome out of LEDs? Um, there's been a lot of advancement in LEDs. They're getting smaller and smaller and closer and closer together. You can uh, bend them or curve them in one direction but as you try and get into complex curves that are required in a dome and have smooth motion, it's very difficult. So I think uh, LED domes may be in the future, but I think it's a, a distant future and not something we're going to see in the next four or five years done very well or very successfully. Uh, there's also weight and power and heat issues as you look into doing very large arrays of these laser of these diodes or uh, LED-based systems. Uh, next slide, please. So we've talked a lot about projection systems. Now I'd like to talk about a little bit of, of capabilities of digital systems. Next. Uh, first on image quality. Um, next slide, please. When we started doing these uh, multiple projector systems, uh, it was important to us to make sure that we had a system that could align and blend the system well so that uh, you customers could take care of your systems on your own without ca calling Javier and Jesus and uh, Enrique to come and align and blend your system for you. So we have auto alignment systems that are enable you with the click of a button to align your systems nearly perfectly on the dome within three or four minutes. So there's no reason in today's world of technology that you need to have a star show with double stars and have poorly aligned and blend projectors. And so I'd encourage you as you're shopping around for a projection system to make sure that there's a, a good proven alignment and blending system available from the manufacturer. Next slide, please. So yeah, voila, there it is. See how easy it was? Next. One of the focuses of Evans and Sellerin over the past s several years has been making it easier for you as planetarians and producers to get the imagery you want up on the dome quickly and easily, to make it cheaper, as Mark talked about this morning, to increase your capability to, to, to do shows in real time so you don't have to spend a lot of time rendering video. Next slide, please. One of the things that I'm most uh, proud of at Evans and Southern was a, a function that we call Show Builder. What Show Builder allows you to do is create a scene 
and then take a snapshot of it. So you can create a scene here on Earth and take a snapshot, and then you can go to the moon and create another scene and create a, a snapshot, and then to Mars or to Saturn and create another sna snapshot. And Digistar will transition between those snapshots automatically and smoothly. You can set the time that you want to stay on each snapshot and also the transition time. And so it's a very easy and simple way for you as customers to create real-time shows and get across to your audiences the ideas and the concepts that you want. It's a powerful tool, and I think it's a great opportunity. We've had a grade school and, and junior high and high school students create great shows using these tools. Next. Content. Uh, Mark talked today a lot about content this morning, about scientific visual visualization and how to get content up on the dome, how to get content from the uh, scientists and those that are doing the, the work into the planetarium so that you can share it with your audiences. And so ENS, uh, we've focused on this to try and make it easier for you to get that into your theaters. Next. The first thing we've done is we've created content within Digistar. We have a Digistar Steam library that we're producing. Steam is for science, technology, engineering, art, and math. And so inherently on the system, we ship many examples of, of these different sci science and art and math uh, concepts so that you can share them and help teach those that come to your theaters. A couple that are uh, significant is we have a complete 3D model of the human body. It has the skeletal, the circulatory, the muscular, and other systems. These are 3D models that can be animated. You can fly into, around, and show them up close and, and teach people about the body. Another one that I like is we have an interactive periodic table so you can teach uh, your students about uh, chemistry and, and the elements. And there's a, a ton of data, and this is just the beginning. It's going to continue to grow and grow, allowing you to do uh, much more than just astronomy and entertainment in your dome, but other sciences that you can share with your, your audiences. Next. Another thing that we focused on uh, was a cloud library. Uh, the history of Digistar has been the Digistar users group. We've had a large users group of users across the world that have shared content and demos with each other. But it was always difficult for us to figure out how to get that between sites. And so we spent a lot of time uh, producing a cloud library so that with one click of a button, Digistar will gather up all the elements of a, of a show that you do and, and put it up and store it on the cloud. Once it's on the cloud, uh, you can see who created it. Uh, there's a rating system, so you can rate it. And then you can, also, you can also see how many people have downloaded it. And with the click of another button, it will download automatically to your system. And it will load all the files to each of the individual computers automatically so you don't have to do it yourself. And so as soon as it's downloaded, you can play it back immediately in your dome theater. So this has been a powerful tool to get and allow customers to share content all around the world. Next slide, please. In the little less than three years since we introduced the cloud library, Digistar customers have shared more than 1,000 items with each other. And those can be complete shows. They can be vignettes. They can be demos. They can be short video clips. Next. Mark uh, talked today about uh, the Data to Dome initiative that IPS ha has, has introduced and adopted and that ESO and other uh, scientific companies are using to, it's a format uh, in which you can put your, can create data so that uh, planetarium systems can take that data and display it immediately on the dome. And it's a way to get data out to planetarians very quickly and efficiently. And as Mark mentioned, Digistar was the initial platform used by ESO to develop data to dome. And it allows you to get a lot of the content, like Mark showed this morning, out to your theater quickly and efficiently. There's tens of thousands of pieces of content available today uh, from ESO 
on the DigiStar system. And we expect that to continue to grow and to blossom as it gets adopted. In fact, you as users, if you want, can use this format and create uh, content in this format in order to get it out to planetariums all over the world. Next slide, please. Another thing that uh, we're excited about is what we call dome casting. Next. What dome casting is, is the ability for you to connect domes all over the world. So uh, someone here at the dome here at IPM that maybe was an expert on the Mayan culture could give a lecture and share that lecture with domes all over the world. Uh, they could log uh, other domes around the world could allow the presenter here to control their dome so they see exactly what it is that you're seeing here at IPN and they can also hear the voice and see the image of the presenter. So this is a powerful tool to get experts in astronomy and other sciences around the world that can present without having to travel to those sites and can get more bang for their buck by giving a presentation once but having to be seen by many others around the world. We're excited about this capability and I think it had a great future. Next. There's a lot of hype and a lot of discussion in the media about virtual and augmented reality. And so we've talked about that and thought about how can we use that in the dome? How does it make sense to use in, in our industry? Uh, the, th the first thing what we've done is we've created an output from Digistar, from a Digistar workstation or producer, to a VR headset. So you can now uh, take the output from your Digistar workstation directly into an Oculus Rift or HTC Vibe headset so you can pre-visualize uh, the shows as you produce those shows. Uh, you can put in a, a planetarium seat on the bottom and then you can see uh, and use that headset to see and preview your shows without having to go into the dome. If you don't want to, uh, the other option is anything that you produce in real time, any of the scenes in real time then will be available to view in 3D in full 360 degrees with the VR headset. So that's the first step that we've taken uh, to introduce virtual reality into a planetarium system. Uh, we're not sure exactly where it's going to go. We're interested in your feedback to see where you want us to take that capability. But it's an interesting technology, uh, interesting um, in, the, in the aspect that a lot of content will be produced uh, for virtual reality headsets. And that can also be uh, shown in your dome theaters and in your planetariums. Next. Uh, last, I just wanted to give a nod to audio. Uh, we've talked a lot about projection and system capabilities. Uh, audio is also an important element in your dome theater. Most theaters today use a 5.1 or 7.1 audio system. Uh, there's uh, some theaters in the industry in planetariums that are adopting what's called 3D spatial audio. And you may hear uh, terms such as Dolby Atmos, is Sono, or there's a German company by the name of Fraunhofer that is offering 3D spatial audio. These 3D spatial audio systems use an array of many, many speakers behind the dome. Uh, as many as 32 and up to 64 speakers behind the dome so you can create 3D spatial audio and as you move an object on the dome, you can follow it around the dome with audio. Um, these systems are typically quite expensive and very intensive to use in the program. So it's something that you need to consider uh, when you're looking at budgets, but it's an, an element that I thought we should talk about and mention in the future of planetariums. Next. So we think that the future of planetarium dome theaters is very bright. It is high contrast, uh, a lot of shared media and content, and doing that in a quick and, and, and immediate way, uh, more realism and more immersive. And so we're excited about the future. We continue to work hard to uh, look what's out on the horizon and bring that technology to you so that you can, again, use that in your presentations and in your content development to immerse your audiences and give them uh, the experience that you all want to give them. Uh, thank you for your time. Uh, if there's any questions, I'm happy to take those now. Just Kirk. 
nos regalan tantita luz, casi no se, no distingo si estoy viendo la gente. ¿Alguna pregunta? ¿Alguien que quiera comentar algo? ¿Cuándo va a llegar? Gabriel, por favor. Sí, bueno, muy amable, me gustaría preguntarte si eh, el hecho de que las producciones para domo puedan ser vistas con, en, con estos cascos de realidad virtual no aminora la posibilidad de que la gente vaya a los domos. ¿no? O sea, al final no sé si eso puede ser como un, una herramienta que al final haga que la gente deje de ir a los planetarios. Um, I don't think so. I think the planetarium is a very unique experience, and I don't think you can get that experience from a VR headset. It was actually here in Mexico, uh, I think it was in the Conferencia in Torreón, where one of the content producers that was there and I had a conversation, and he was very concerned that uh, VR was going to take over and replace planetariums. But I really don't believe that's the case. I believe that there is a role for that for VR in our industry, and it will enhance the the experience by injecting some interesting content into planetariums, but I don't really believe that, that VR headsets are going to take over the planetarium and, and stop people from coming. I think we saw the same thing when HDTV came out. There was a concern that people would stop going to movies. And when 4K TVs came out, people would stop going to movies. But we haven't seen that, and I don't think we'll see that in planetariums either. Eh, vamos a preparar la siguiente, es un estreno que viene de Eduardo Piña de Universum. Les pedimos unos minutos, por favor. Para...